Hi, my name is Brianna White. You may know me as the English voice of Aerith in Final Fantasy VII Remake, and you're watching the Points of Experience podcast. The person we are about to speak to, who you just heard from, Brianna White, the voice of Aerith in Final Fantasy VII. Um, I mean, we've spoken with Caleb, who's the voice of Zack, and now we are speaking with Aerith. I mean, the two of them are my favorite characters in kind of all of video games, RPGs for sure. It's crazy. Um, the remake has been such... A masterpiece so far with the first installment and with Rebirth coming, the excitement is is palpable through the world and myself and fans alike. And Brianna is such a tremendously amazing person. Um, and her her enthusiasm for the series for Aerith is absolutely infectious and all of her insight on how she got this role, how she got started into acting, how she never gave up on herself and how truly persevering and believing and, and following her dreams and her passions um, led to this opportunity and moment and how lucky we are to have heard her take on Aerith and all of the intricacies and, and beautiful um, moments that are not in the original game because there was no voice acting and to see the evolution of Aerith in this installment and to hear her her ta her take and perspective on that was really eye opening and and um I think you all here if you're fans of acting you will enjoy it from an actor's perspective and if you are a fan of Final Fantasy uh brace yourself because this is a top episode guys I'm gonna say it right here top episode uh Brianna is amazing so much so much most so much uh Guys, like, subscribe uh, to the channel. Leave us reviews on Spotify if you're listening or watching there. Um, and just stay tuned. Get ready to embrace your dreams and embrace uh, the Points of Experience podcast with Brianna White. Coming up. Truly, this must be one of the most exciting episodes for me today. Um, if you haven't heard from the intro already, um, Brianna White is here, the voice of Aerith, a phenomenal actor, human being. I cannot be more excited. I've said it too many times. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and do oh, this. God, th this is a tremendous honor. I mean, most people here who have been listening to the show or know me know how big of a fan I am of Final Fantasy VII, how big a fan I am of Aerith as a character. Um and then to like for me to have had a small part in this game to be a part of this world and some sort of you know I've got to share a scene you know that we've seen through clips that have been released uh, uh -huh. it was kind of a whole surreal moment and it's um, your performance your portrayal of Aerith throughout this entire rebirth remake um, Final Fantasy uh, experience has brought such a depth and layer to the character that it is it is it is breathtaking really and I truly mean that from the bottom of my heart um I, I don't I don't think that there is a human on this planet who could have done what you have done and portrayed and I see the love and the care you put into the character <laughs> I truly mean that um Thank I've watched you. you play I've watched you play the game I've watched you experience it and I see the human emotional connection that you have to this character and I'm just really excited to kind of talk about that in the process and your life and everything that that um you've you've had as a as a gift through being a part of the Final Fantasy family. Golly, well, I'll start with thank you cuz <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um I I that's quite a flattering portrayal of of what I've done and um just thank you. I appreciate that. I truly do mean it and there there's going to be a lot of uh, Final Fantasy stuff to talk about, but I would yes. love to to rewind a little bit if you don't mind and get to know Please. a little bit about you um and kind of where everything as an actor as a human where this all kind of started that led you to these moments to these days or weeks whatever this is before, you know, the second installment of Final Fantasy comes out. Uh where this love and for performance started kind of what the upbringing was that led to where you are is it did you you grew up in California am I correct in that That's statement correct. yes and where did the acting or the performance or the idea that you would become an actor one day come from 
It's interesting because I've always said it started in second grade with my first school play, but I actually think back and I think my mom has a home video of me sitting in a red rocking chair, holding a teddy bear, singing a song. I don't remember what the song is anymore. I'd have to ask her, but I think I've always loved some aspect of performing um, and I have to assume that came from watching movies or cartoons. I, I can't say that for sure, but I know, I know for sure my, my earliest memories are in second grade. My school decided they were going to put on a school play. It was Annie Jr. Uh huh. And, uh, which is a classic school play. <laughs> We've all done it, right? Yep. Um, and I got cast as Molly. Okay. And, uh, which means that I had the first line in the first school play that my school ever did. And Whoa. yes, my parents were very proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> and they made sure to tell me and tell everyone that they know. And, you know, as your standard oldest daughter, I was stoked to make my parents proud. And yeah. I was just going to repeat that. In, in any way that I could possibly do so. And um, I just so happen to absolutely, absolutely love the theater mm. and the theater experience. It was it was so much fun for me. And um, mostly because I love that kind of ensemble feeling. I love a group of friends getting together to make something that's never been made before. Um, and that, that, was, that was it. That was my first experience in my memory of like, I want to do this. Yeah. And how did that evolve from there? Did it just mean doing more school plays, doing community theater? Where did where did that lead you to? As I mean, second grade is pretty early, so up until high school, and then doing drama that way. Pretty much, you know, my parents were were absolutely wonderful in that. Once I said I loved something, they supported that all the way. Amazing. And so I got to do theater every year in my school play uh, through high school. And then I even did some summer theater and I did some like larger community theater. I pretty much did everything that I could fit into my schedule. And my parents were very wonderful mm. to just support that in every single way. And so did theater all through high school and decided, you know, this is it for me. I'm going to be an actress. This is all I've ever really wanted to do with my, I mean, I say that, but you know, I toyed around with other careers. Um, but I said, I at least have to try acting. Mm. You know, I grew up in, in Orange County, which okay. is, um, just below Los Angeles. And so not only I knew, but a bunch of my family members all live here and they all knew what kind of Hollywood was like. We all sure. kind of knew someone who knew someone who's, daughter or niece was, you know, in the industry, mm -hmm. not in any way that I could take advantage of sure. connections, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> but they knew the dangers of the industry. Yeah. It was well known to all my family, you know, primarily how hard it is, yeah. how competitive it is. Um, and once you actually succeed there, how icky it can be for young people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was warned of all of that. My whole childhood, they yeah. said, yes, you can love it. Absolutely. We support you, but you can't make a career out of it. Wow. And, and despite I all that, said, you continued. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm going to college for this. Okay. So I went to college for acting and got, got into NYU. That's where I went. No way. Yes. Did you really? Yes, I went to NYU. I studied at the Meisner Studio. You did? Yes, yes. I am a violet as well. That is hysterical. No, we definitely know people. That's, that's crazy. crazy. So you, so, okay, to make sense of this too, first of all, that's hysterical and funny and amazing. And I think it says a lot about, I, I truly loved my experience at NYU. I don't know if that was the same Wait, experience. Wait, okay, so then I have to know if you know personally Anna Brisbane. I, I, of course I know Anna. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because Anna also went to NYU in the same years. But what's crazy is I also didn't meet her. Yeah, well, that's the same with me. I know Anna now through, and she's been on the podcast, friend that's of the wild. show, as we say. But yes, that is so funny. My gosh. Um, 
yeah, I got Anna with my agent, uh, Dean Panero. She's a great friend. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, small world, small. So did you did you enjoy small your world? But because we didn't meet each other, it's actually a huge world. <laughs> true, very true. That's weird. I can't believe that. I know. I so I did I did two years of Meisner, and then I did a, a summer of Meisner. I did my whole thing there because I was a transfer student in two and a half years. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you did. Did you do? So I graduated early. Yes, I, finished in I read three that. years. Okay, yes. so you were so hardcore. I did two two years of um, new studio on Broadway, mm-hmm. and then the next one I did Stone Street for the full year. Wow! And then I was done. Wow! And did you enjoy that experience coming from California to the Big Apple and kind of you know a, a tough place to cut your teeth, so to speak? Did you enjoy? It? Did you find it helpful? Did you find it challenging? Did you not like it? I knew that I would love New York City because when I was 16, I got a like a mailer for a leadership program that was centered around theater. Okay. And it, I mean, those kind of like programs, those kind of like extracurricular like programs are very common for high schools. Yeah. Um, But because it said it was theater based and leadership based so that it would appease my parents and look good on college resumes. (laughs) Um, but it was also in New York City, and I had always wanted to travel. I was like, yes, I'm going to convince my parents to let me go to this. And so I got to do, I don't even know how long it was, maybe two weeks, maybe three, yeah. um, of a leadership summit in New York City. And that's when I like made up my mind. I was like, New York City, that is, that's where I want to go to college. I want to spend more time there. Okay, so did you apply only to NYU, or did you do like Julia, <laughs> Juilliard, Columbia? Uh... I, I applied to a number of different schools. But you know how they they categorize it into you have your like standard, uh, you think you'll probably get into these places, then you have your reach schools, and then you have your safety schools. Mm -hmm. Um, I applied to a number of reach schools because it was easy with the, what is the one application called? Uh, I don't remember it anymore, but there used to be like one application for all the schools that they all accepted. And so you could just kind of like apply one time yeah. and then just send in different essays for different schools. Yes, I, rem- so I remember, I applied, but I don't remember what that I is. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. So I applied for a number of schools I didn't think I would get into just because why not? Yeah. You know, I'll write the essays. It's fine. Um, but as far as theater programs go, I only auditioned for two programs that required an audition. NYU was one yep, of them. I remember. And then <laughs> UCLA was the other one. Okay. Except I didn't want to go to UCLA. My dad wanted me to go to UCLA. And I don't think I've ever said this before, but I didn't finish the application on purpose. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I won't tell. No one tell. No one tell. (laughs) Sometimes my dad watches the stuff that I do. So sorry, dad, if you're Oh, my gosh. Well. (laughs) I really didn't want to go to UCLA. (laughs) That's hysterical. So why didn't you want it? Did you, it's because you made your mind up with New York and you were done with California? Like, you, or you just, was it more that you just fell in love with New York and everything that you could learn and experience? All of the above. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. And I love that. That is hysterical. I put all my eggs into one basket and it luckily paid off. <laughs> wow. So, you know what? This makes me want to ask this question too. So, you, uh, the audition for NYU, you know, they get a lot of applicants. It's a pretty, you know, yes. tough school to get into. Um, <clears throat> I don't say that to, to, to make myself sound better. I say that because I've, <laughs> I say that because no, it's, a tough, it's a tough school. Did you, you fell in love with acting really early. When did you realize like you have a talent at this that you were like, good or you had something worth trying to apply and get into these places because that takes a bit of confidence I believe to to put yourself out that way to to apply to these schools and it's a it's a pretty long process like there's callbacks and you got to play to perform two monologues and a song and you know it's a bit of a, a thing right I guess I <laughs> just I just always did well mm. in in theater like I get I I can't say that I specifically got a lot of compliments that meant anything. Mm. I didn't win any awards, but I always got cast in leads or close to leads. So, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know how I knew. Mm. Interesting. Do you think that that has maybe now learning later in life about how you approach acting or auditions or when you book a role, like you're, 
the way that you look at the process or the way that you craft character or the way that you look at acting as a whole in your philosophy? Do you believe that there is something in that that allows you, because specifically in Aerith, not to jump too far, there is something that is so real and authentic and truthful um, about your performance and in your acting that it's it's so grounded. And is, is there some sort of process that you've learned, whether it was through NYU or through experience that you you lean on? Are there tools that you constantly revisit when you're acting? <laughs> I I have to say, I, my like um, acting style has always just been so natural. Mm. Um, I almost got a little bit more tied up when I went to NYU. Interesting. And I've heard that because a lot from people. So that's why I was have curious. You really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I've never heard that from anybody. So I, I've never even really thought about it too deeply before, but all growing up, I've just kind of been sort of a natural people observer, mm -hmm. a person lover and a mimic. And so I just kind of, it kind of came naturally to me. I didn't read the books or watch the theories. I didn't even really watch movies that much. Um, I, I, just, I don't know. Like it just always came naturally to me when I was doing theater. Um, and um, I was really good at memorization, like memorizing lines. And I knew that, yeah. but, but as far as like acting theory, like that was not anything. Wow. All I knew was that I genuinely loved it and had a knack for it in a way that my peers didn't mm. because my peers would oftentimes do drama, you know, because it was a fun extracurricular. But for <laughs> me, it was something that really meant something to me yeah. uh, that I took really seriously. <laughs> and maybe, I don't know, I was always very emotional growing up. And so I was called a drama queen a lot in my life. I don't know if I just kind of like applied that <laughs> where it meant something. I don't sure. know. Um but when I went to NYU, there was so much theory work yeah. and, you know, diving into character and, and body work and breath work and Shakespeare. And that almost really messed with my mind. Mm. Like, I felt like none of it really uh, vibed with me. Sure. I don't know. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I, like I said, I've heard a lot of people say that. And I think specifically like New York theater training. And I think that's, you don't have to go to theater school to become a great actor. There's many people who do not do that. And that is, you know, some of the mm -hmm. best actors we have. I think that there are certain aspects of training that they try to like in, indoctrinate you into this process where it's like if you don't do it this way it's not right therefore it's not good and it becomes results oriented that my experience i'll give you my example was if you could cry it was considered good you know like ah, that yes. was the metric of course are you crying because mm -hmm. then it's good that's good acting mm -hmm. now that was that was it's helpful in certain regards but it didn't have anything to do with portraying real people truthfully and a thing a conversation i had with my teacher because i was kind of like a a goody two shoes to to a certain extent and I, <laughs> and I was always doing extra I really took it seriously like you I remember my my acting teacher we were doing our plays finally and we were doing um the rhymers of eldritch and there's a character in this play I don't know if you're familiar familiar with it his character's named Skelly he's kind of like um this crazy homeless guy that people don't really understand and he's like 70 years old and they wanted me to play this character and I said I appreciate it and I understand it and I get it from a character perspective. But when I leave here in a few months, they are never going to cast me as that. Mm -mm. And I, I was like, I don't want to do this right now. It's my one opportunity because we only had two plays to do. I was like, mm -hmm. I want to play the young guy who drifts into town and doesn't really know what's going on and finds his way. I'm like, that's something I can apply these skill sets to. And I'm, and I'm like, they're like, but you don't see the benefits. I'm like, no, I get it. You know, I get your philosophy on yeah. it, but for me, and I think that was always a strength that I had, maybe similar to what you're experiencing, like all these things and these ways that you want me to like really stretch, I understand from a philosophical perspective, but what I believe I like in great um, cinema, in great theater, in great portrayals of humanity is the people who can connect on a human level. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't cast me as the 70 year old. So let somebody else who wants to do that. That's actually something that is very fundamentally different between theater and television mm -hmm. is in film and TV, you will only ever be cast as who you are. 
because the camera is so close to these eyes that you'll see yep. it. The theater, because the audience is a little bit further back, you have a chance to become who you're not. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of value in that, especially for um, a certain type of actor, like a character actor. Sure. <laughs> there's a reason there's a name for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it never, I never really got, I never really fell in love with that aspect of mm -hmm. it, you know? And so I had a, I had a class called physical acting and it was um, a clowning course and not to say clown like red nose, but clowning, yeah. like learning how to express something directly through your body, like um, yeah. Charlie Chaplin. Yep. Um, and so I had, I had, I had the hardest time with that class. Just a really, really hard time because for me, my acting just didn't come from there. Yeah. Interesting. I bet you I know who your teacher was because um, I had clown and I had play and they were very similar who, who? courses. I had Frank Deal who's become a great friend of mine in my life and a mentor oh, of me, ironically enough. Um, Lucas K. Bruni, Bryce um, Pinkham, who is a very successful and famous Broadway actor now. He taught that. Um and then there was one other teacher whose name's escaping me. My teacher um, was Orlando Bloom. Orlando, no, so he directs. That's ridiculous. He was, no, that's no Orlando, Orlando Bloom. is the first name though. Orlando, um, something. <laughs> why am I saying? Why am I thinking of Orlando Bloom, the actor? It's not Orlando Bloom, not but Orlando I know who Bloom. Orlando is Orlando... because they were also a director. Um, and I saw who's one of their plays. Name? Gosh, someone will will put it in the, the the fact check here. Maybe Keith will pull it. Golly, up that I for sure was like, yeah, his this is his name, and that's not. Yeah, I had reassigned that. No. Yeah, no, but I totally get what you're saying about it, and I saw many people. I saw some really talented people lose their love for theater, for acting, for the whole experience because of being kind of pushed into a mentality that didn't work with them. Yeah. And I think that acting, where it is the display of human being as most vulnerable as you can, depicting real life situations. There's not a one size fits all about how you should be an actor or what is right or what is good. It's all subjective. It and is. I think we are, we can be different puzzle pieces that work in different puzzles, you know? Yeah. And I think one of the core tenets of the studio system that NYU talked about a lot was that we're going to assign you a studio. And mm -hmm. as a transfer student, it wasn't exactly like this, I don't think. But I don't know. You correct me if I'm For wrong. For me, it was. But okay. I advocated and I, I begged to have them put me in the Meisner studio. Oh, OK. So when you get in as a freshman, there is no begging. There's yeah. no conversations at all. <laughs> you just get assigned what you get assigned based on where they think that you fit. First of all, that's based off a one 30-minute audition mm -hmm. and your resume. Yeah. So because I had mostly musicals on my resume, they put me in the musical theater department. And yeah. I, I happened to love that, but a lot of my classmates did not, mm -hmm. which I think is probably why the studio did not last. <laughs> um, <laughs> because a lot of my classmates were really unhappy with that structure, even though I thought it was genius. Yeah. Um, so... So you get assigned your studio and then the idea is that they're going to break you of all of your bad habits. They're going to break you down to the core essence and teach you a new foundation of what acting is. Yeah. And I get it, but also um, I didn't get it. Like it didn't, I didn't find a new foundation there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where did you find that new foundation or where did you did? And I'm actually curious, did you after you graduated from Stone Street or you went into Stone Street with, you know, for whatever value you had from there? Was it an immediate move from New York back to California and then like just throwing yourself into like trying to find work or what was that? So I actually um, I graduated early from NYU specifically because I knew that you didn't need a degree to be an actor preach and yes. I felt like after my first year I felt like I was wasting my time mm. because you're only so young in the Hollywood mm -hmm. industry you're always five years too old and um so I wanted to get back home and I wanted to start working yeah. and I said I don't know if if this schooling is necessarily helping me find what I need to find 
Yeah. And what's interesting is um, <laughs> acting classes did not teach me that foundation that I was talking about. What taught me that foundation that I was looking for was working. Yeah. And um, I did countless student films while I was in while I was at NYU because I did the same thing in New yeah. York, which is so funny. Yeah. The student films really allowed me to find my creative freedom to, to build a foundation on what works and what doesn't work when you are working with a crew, when you're actually making something instead of just doing an exercise in class. Yeah. Um, and when you actually get a chance to work in a collaborative way, instead of the acting program is a lot of like, do your work and then feedback mm -hmm. or criticism, mm -hmm. you know, and so everybody's criticism is going to be different. Everyone's going to have a different opinion of what worked and what didn't work. Um, and it, it's just not, it wasn't conducive for me. I very much work with a collaborative mindset. And mm. so I was able to build that foundation through working on student films. Um, and one of the film teachers there um, knew I was trying to drop out of college. Mm. And he said, um, what if you didn't drop out? What if you finished school and I'll set, set you up with an agent after you graduate? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. He totally took a chance on me. And for no reason. Out of the goodness of his heart, he just wanted to see me graduate with a college degree. And this was a New York teacher? Yeah. A film wow. school teacher, not even an acting school teacher. Wow. Not someone I would have known if I hadn't made the decision to start working on the film program's student films and not just work work in theater. Yep. Um, so that's how I got my first agent. I graduated. I moved right back. And luckily, I'm from here, so it was easy enough. Moved back in with my parents yep. and uh, started working right away. Wow. 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 That's so amazing. And I can I, I can already sense such similarities in the, the philosophy of just this business of, you know, just like getting to work, experiencing things. Like, I was the same way. During school, like, they told us we couldn't audition during school. Yeah. I was going to auditions in between class. Yeah, I was. Same. I had my skateboard in New York City. I was blitzing down. Totally. Uh, Try and stop me. Yeah, yeah. I I didn't care. And I remember one of the teachers that became my mentor. One day I had to get to his class, and I was like running out. And he was like, "Where are you going?" I was like, "I'm gonna be honest with you. I have an audition. <laughs> I will be back in 30 minutes." And he just goes, "Go," and he just instantly from there. He got, he, he understood, mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? And I really appreciated that. And I think as much as school could be great for people and that structure is wonderful for people, maybe people who don't really have an understanding of what is, what, what in them is valuable yet, like what they have to offer. Maybe they're still figuring that out. School can be a way to do that. But when you're trying to make a living out of this business and you're trying to like really capitalize on the moment and what you have to offer, if you understand a little bit of that, it's like, you got to just spread your wings and try and fail on the job. Um, I see all the time recently now, like they talk about like perpetual students. Yeah. There's people who fall in love with like just learning and, uh, yeah. that's, you know, great if you want to do that, but it can be very dangerous, um, to well, romanticize it, learning it, too it's, much. It's, it's, just a mindset thing too, because I never did my learning when I was in school. Mm -hmm. I just, I didn't learn in school. I didn't learn in high school. I didn't learn in elementary school. <laughs> I just, I learned from everything outside of that. I learned yeah. from my extracurriculars. I learned from my parents. I learned from my peers. I, I learned about life, not reading a textbook about four plus four equals eight. Yeah. You know, and so for me, acting was a lot of the same way. Like I just, I learned through doing. Yeah. And I, the cool thing about that is then you still get to be a lifelong learner uh -huh. because you get to learn every time you go to work. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I learned a lot while I was working on remake. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. I am, uh, I mean, I am so curious to hear about that and what you quantify as the learning experiences. Um, I, but before we get there, I mean, so just to quickly cover this, um, you, you, you move back to LA, you've got yeah. this agent, you're doing short films, you're doing feature films. I've mm -hmm. you've gotten to do stuff on TV. You're, you're working regularly to a certain extent. Um, that's, what was that's a real way to put it in retrospect. But at the time, it felt like 
hustle and grind every <laughs> second of the day. Like yeah. it was really dedicated hard work all the time. I mean, you know, Actors Access, Breakdown Express, just submitting, self-submitting for anything I could get my hands on. Oh, anything God. I could possibly fathom myself fitting in, I submitted. Thousands yeah. of submissions to account for those two films. <laughs> I it's that's so how it real. goes. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's applicable to a lot of careers, but so much for acting where you see people like, oh, you got to do this, this, and this. And it's like, you don't know the thousands of auditions that came before the lightning that struck to give me exactly. this opportunity. Exactly. And then it's like, what are you going to make of this opportunity? Or what is that opportunity going to make for you? Because a lot of times mm -hmm. we do things and it's it doesn't it doesn't become Final Fantasy. No. It doesn't, you know what I mean? So no. um, we just, we had Caleb Pierce on. Uh, oh, yay! Right before you, love and Caleb. we talk, we it's fantastic. I love him, and we <laughs> talked about that. You know, these these thousands of auditions we do, and we don't know what's going to become Final Fantasy. Um, we are lucky to be um, part of these franchises or vessels to characters that are elevated to such a large screen for people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's. I, I, I have such fond memories of living in New York at the time. I mean, because I moved from New York to L.A. Um, because of a drought of like mm. opportunity for work within theater, on camera and TV to pursue voiceover um, because that was the thing that was paying my bills. It kept returning to me. Um, where were you doing any VO or did you have a VO agent who was sending you out for voiceover? How did even this opportunity for Final Fantasy come about within this years of being back in L.A. and, and grinding? So I would say that as as a as a callback um the one thing that I actually did take from NYU that was very valuable okay they told me to um do it myself <laughs> Don't wait yeah make your own stuff uh, and they were <laughs> brutal about that messaging. Yeah. They said, because it was like, you know, the, everybody can turn on a camera and put post on YouTube these days, mm -hmm. make your own content. Um, so I got into my agent's office and, um, they said, well, okay, so, so what's, what's your bullseye? What's your type? What can you do? We talked about on camera work. We talked about commercial work. I gave him a headshots. And then I said, you know, I'd really like to look into starting to do VO too, because at that point I was so hungry and so in the like midst of the hustle that I was doing acting work. I was doing uh, commercial work. I was doing modeling. I was doing, um, what are those called? Industrials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was doing print work. I was doing hand modeling. Like I was doing anything I could get my hands on because A, I had bills to pay. <laughs> And B, I just wanted to work. Like I yeah. want to make this career real. Yeah. Um, I was desperate for it. It was the only option for me. And so um, I told my agent, you know, I'd love to get into VO. Um, can we, can we look into that? And she said, okay, well, what voices can you do? And I was like, you're hearing it. <laughs> yeah. Like I could, I, I do silly voices like but you know I don't know like I, had, I didn't I had like a commercial VO class in college yeah and she goes um listen everybody wants to be a voice actor so if you can't show what you can do then let's look elsewhere mm. and I said okay <laughs> well that was oddly aggressive <laughs> Um, so I specifically wanted to get into voiceover like in 2014 and did not receive any sort of help okay. from my agents. Um, no, no faith, no, no trust, nothing. Um, so I kind of had set that voiceover work to bed because the industry professional that I had spoken to said that if you're not doing Bugs Bunny voices, then you can't be a voice actor. Mm. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'll focus on other things. I, I, I hear no all day. Let's go like yeah. moving on. Um, and so I didn't do any voiceover work. I just got to put a dis quick disclaimer here on that story is that is 
terrible advice yeah, for anybody listening. Is. Okay, sorry, I didn't interrupt. It interrupt. Is. <laughs> no, that, that's that's incorrect. Yes. That's false. That's why that story is so funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who didn't get the sarcasm, uh, yeah, terrible advice. Uh, yes. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, and that you know she wasn't a voiceover agent, so she didn't know, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't expect her to know everything. Mm-hmm. Um. But uh, like I said, I, I put the voiceover dream to bed. I said, I'll focus on what I'm, what I know I'm good at, what I know I can do. Yeah. Um, and I got um, an email one day uh, from my, uh, from my theatrical agent. So my film and TV agent um, for an audition for this video game um, that had a, like a, you know, it was all NDA, so it wasn't clear what it was for. Mm-hmm. Um, but because I played video games, I could kind of figure it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yep. But the email was addressed to someone else. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. So the email was addressed to someone else. And so I responded to my agent, yes, I want this audition. Was this email for me? <laughs> and uh, so he called me and he said, yeah, the casting director actually was asking about this other girl, but um, the other girl didn't want it or wasn't available. And so um, I you know, told them to take a look at all the other people on my roster. And uh, she saw your theatrical demo on IMDb and she wants to audition you now. No way. Yeah. <laughs> truly <laughs> okay okay yeah i think a lot of people would call that like divine astrological whatever you want to fate of some kind okay so you've 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 gotten this mir- miracle audition it accidentally into my lap yes oh my god okay so so yes. you get the audition um what happens you're, you 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 know what the game is because you're, you're putting pieces together i know the game i know um, the character um and so i start researching like crazy mm-hmm. and i learn everything that i can i listen to all of her previous voice actors english and in, in japanese um, and I say, this is going to be the coolest audition of my life that I will never be able to tell anyone about. Because um, if you didn't book it, you weren't allowed to tell anyone that you even had auditioned. Yep. That was yep. the terms of the NDA. Yep. Um, so I go in saying, I'm not going to be able to tell anyone that I auditioned for this because I know I'm not going to book it because Mm -hmm. they're going to go with famous people because all of her previous voice actors are famous people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Mandy Moore, you know, Haley Joe. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So So I was, I was pretty sure this is going to be like the coolest, most fun thing that I would ever audition for, Mm -hmm. uh, but it wouldn't come to anything. And um, I auditioned in the room. It was in like person because this is pre-COVID. Yes. yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So they called me into a studio. I did the audition and they asked me in the audition, so, you know, what's your voiceover experience? And I said, none. And they said, but you're good at this. <laughs> and I said, well, I play a lot of video games. <laughs> wow. They had me do like battle efforts that I had never done before. Yeah. And I just. I guess had played enough video games that I was able to mimic it with some sort of accuracy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it sounds stupid when I say it like that. Like, no, I, it is not. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, I had the exact same experience. Granted, I was doing voiceover. My first okay. video game was Square Enix's Neo The World Ends With You, the main mm-hmm. character. I had never done a video <laughs> game. And because I played so much Kingdom Hearts, so much of every Final Fantasy, all of those things, I knew, probably similar to you, what it, what this storytelling experience is like. And it is yeah. very much, sli- not slice of life, because that's not the right way, but it is real people. These yeah. are real people. It, it is not like, it's not, hey, video game stuff! It's, no. these are people talking with real stuff. This might as well be a feature film that's yes. on a con- console. Yeah, pretty much. That's crazy. So you, they, they're, they're telling you you're so good at this, and they're like, where did you come from? Yeah. Um, then what happens? You don't hear for two years? <laughs> What's the deal? Many months. Yeah. 
many months I was sure that I didn't book it. Um, and then I, and then I did. <laughs> now, can you put me, can you put yourself <laughs> back? Can you put for, for everyone listening? Can you, can you remember the, the place, the feeling, everything that was going through the fact that you overcame, like what you said was a insurmountable, astonishing feat to be someone who's never done this before. You're not somebody who is a celebrity in that sense yet. And to get that, what was Still it? Still am not just for the record. <laughs> I would, I would argue that one right now a little bit. I'd argue, I think, I think, I think if there's any people in the world of video games who are celebrities, it's the cast of Final Fantasy VII. I mean, you know, I'm calling a spade a spade there. <laughs> I still do my own grocery shopping, so... Sure, sure, but this, this game, <laughs> this franchise... It doesn't get bigger. It is main stage Comic Con. This is yeah. every single publication outside of. I mean, uh, there's a reason celebrities do Final Fantasy. That is true. Do you know what I'm saying? There is a yes. reason why this has such colossal attention. There, it, it, you know, I, I, I appreciate your humbleness. I truly do. <laughs> um, but it is, it is, it doesn't get much bigger than this. It is, it is among the top three of 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 impactful video games of our lifetime of our lifetime i would love to think that but i also couldn't handle thinking that way okay so. fair fair enough fair enough uh, fair enough so so to, to put you back into that moment yes. in time what was wh wh was it an email was it a phone call did you scream did you punch the glass what was it it was an email mm -hmm. and i was sitting on my couch don't remember what I was doing on my couch. Maybe just kind of scrolling on my phone. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and uh, I got the email and I really felt the world spin. <laughs> I, I wasn't dizzy per se, but it felt like... Maybe it felt like the world stopped spinning would wow. be a better way to describe it. Like... It just, it felt like totally out of body. Like, I can't believe they want me to do this. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even supposed to audition. <sighs> Chills. And then everything just came crashing down. Like, I can do this. Mm. Everyone in my whole life who told me I can't, they were wrong. Yeah. I can't do this. That is that so was amazing. Really cool. It's a beautiful feeling, not only just because of what the game is and what I believe you understood it to mean, but for you personally, as a human, as an actor, yeah. to find success in yeah. what somebody told you you couldn't do. Yeah. Um, you know, against the conventional studio systems format of how you should be an actor. All of these things in your life pointing towards grind because that's what this career is for 99% of the people who pursue acting. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't know the way that you will find success. For some people, it's through being flow from progressive. For yes. some people, it is becoming Daniel Day-Lewis. For some people, it's becoming Aerith Gainsborough in Final Fantasy VII. Um, that allows people to know you a little bit more. Um which doesn't quantify how you are as an actor, but it gives you an opportunity and the stage to say, this is what I have, and this is where my talent is, and this is, these, these are my chops. This is how much I care about storytelling. Um, how beautiful to get that opportunity um, in such a magnificent way. And just congratulations. I know we're on the third game for you at this point, right? Third? This is the fourth? Third? Uh, well, yeah, it is. It's the second in the remake, remake series. But Crisis but Core. Crisis Core yes. was its own thing. Yes. yes. So just congratulations. Thank and you. again, to reiterate what I said in the beginning, um, I deeply mean this. I deeply mean this. I'm not saying this, I, you know, because I every guest I often have compliments for, but I truly mean this as a fan. I'm stepping out of the interview here. When I got to play this game, um, it first of all, for me, it was the biggest heartbreak in my life to not have the opportunity to audition for because I wasn't in LA at the time. <laughs> um, but then to, exp and then as an actor, 
to be able of someone pursuing voice acting at the time to play this game. It was like being a tremendous fan of the. I mean, I literally like all around. I, I have. You can't see it. I have like Final Fantasy memorabilia oh, everywhere. I've got cute. a. I've got a clock. I've got like you know. Come on, don't fall and break. Um, I got you know like three D printed clouds. I'm just oh, like that's a, awesome. I'm such a fan of this series and the work that you guys did, specifically you. Um. It's astounding, and that's why I've been so curious about your process, your method, and I would love to talk a little bit about, you know, you've got this role now, and I know you've researched as much as you can. They booked you because of something. There had to have been some sort of spark, some sort of connection that they saw in your audition or auditions that was different than everybody else, that on a deep level, cerebrally, physically, or emotionally, because I've seen you, um, I've watched videos of you play the game, and it's fascinating to watch you, like those first time experiences of you seeing the game, it is fascinating to see you go through, and I heard and I heard you talk about it, like the first scene, you were like, I feel like it was me as Aerith experiencing this moment, um, which I just find, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me that that's how you felt. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, the booking experience and working on it, maybe what went into that, or at least the moment by moment of like the first couple of days of recording that, solidified what Aerith has become now? Sure. Um, you know, Aerith in Remake is actually so much more than what she was before. Mm. Um, and I think that was one of the goals of the Remake project is to deepen your understanding of the characters and to expand the world, the characters, the universe. And so when I went into the booth for the first recording session, um, we did a few takes of a few different lines, and uh, they, they actually had to pull me out of the booth and into the, the recording area and say, let's have a conversation about her character. Mm. Um, because I knew her in the way that most people know her on the surface. Sure. As far as she is a flower seller mm. and she's, you know, girly, you know, she's the one who wears a dress compared to Tifa who mm. is in, she's the spider, you know, she's the gloves and the mini skirt, you yep. know. Um, and, and Aerith is, is really girly. Um, and they actually um, said, you know, we want to see... Um, we want to see something behind, behind that. Mm. Um, she, here's, here's her, her backstory. Here's her, her, um, her core essence. She's had a very tough life and she has had to fight to survive. Yeah. And through all of that, she is hopeful <laughs> and wants to and has to is compelled to share that with others mm -hmm. that's what she represents is hope and so don't condense her down to well she's happy and sunshiny and girly those things can be true mm -hmm. but that's not her core essence of who she is yep and that conversation changed everything for me. Wow. Because I got so much more excited than I already was because I didn't know based on her previous iterations what she would become in remake. Yep. And so I went on the journey same as y'all. Anybody who played the game and said, "Oh, I never knew Aerith was like this." I, I had that same journey yeah. when we began recording. That was something I really loved about Remake. Um, obviously, I played the first game, and you see flavors of what you're describing to a certain extent. Um, but there is, in like the comparison you were making a bit, you know, it's easy to put Tifa as the, the badass brawler and Aerith as yes. the, the soft, kind, sweet girl. Um, in this, we see, and not to create a comparison between the two characters, but... We see strength 
in mm. vastly different ways and similar ways at times between these two characters, but just how, especially for a female lead character to have strength within that archetype that you described, that we've yes. known about. To see a character who has gone through such stuff and f to still have so much hope and to still find pleasure and sass and instigation at times and absolutely and banter and you know like to find those moments um and to, and have a, a a will to to keep fighting despite yeah. all of that it was so beautiful to see that in remake and and again this is a kudos to you because that's not really shown to that extent in any other iteration no, I think one thing that Remake did really well in bringing to light for her, because, you know, her her backstory and who she is, that's all in the original Final Fantasy VII. Sure. But what I think Remake really brought to her is a sense of playfulness. Mm -hmm. the, just the fun that she is and that she has and that she shares with others, I think is brought so much stronger yep. in remake um and and i don't say this to toot my own horn but voice acting didn't exist in final fantasy 7 mm -hmm. and i think the the voice brings that playfulness so much more to light you than in, it did. you instantly put my mind back to that scene it's the first scene i believe it's it's cloud and i almost said you and cloud Aerith and cloud <laughs> Aerith. i put it truly to a it, that's eerie in that way um uh, cloud and Aerith are going i believe it's to her house or to the slums it's they're running and there's like monsters along the way and every quip Aerith has every quip there's like she's like oh i'm glad the uh, she's like i'm glad the monsters went for the stronger person or like <laughs> Are you like there's just these little quips that she says that in yes. the lines, if you read them as written, you would take it as face value. But yes. the performance adds this layer of like, I know you're I know you think you're Mr. Tough Guy, you know, yes. like there's this layer of of like uh, and from a, 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 a an arc of the story in between Cloud and Aerith's relationship, which is one mm. of the most beautiful things um, for many reasons um, to see his shell open so slowly through yeah. these little tactics that Aerith plays to see totally. this character who's so closed off, who is so afraid to let people in, who has been so isolated throughout his whole life, and then to have this character like Aerith, who has dealt with her own sense of adversity, her own sense of abandonment, her own sense of loneliness, to find the will and the hope and the passion to sense something in Cloud and be like, there's something to this guy. And I, the the tactics that have been existing around him are not working. Um, let's see if we can slowly unfurl this flower. My God, the alliteration. <laughs> um, but you really do add that layer, and it's so beautiful. And I, it, and that's why I can I can remember I can remember playing remake and putting myself to the day, the moment, the scenes, experiencing them. And I only played remake once through, um, yeah. and I can still viscerally remember these moments. Yeah. There, it, it's, in, in recording it, I had the sense that there would be certain lines that people would latch onto mm -hmm. because they were so fun. Yeah. And I got to experience the joy of recording them and anticipating that people would love them as much as I did. And then when I got to stream them, and experience them myself in their full fleshedness. Yeah. And then being able to like watch other people's streams and watch other people react to those moments. It really, it really isn't just, it, it's really not just me. Like it's the writing. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. it's the experience. It's the way the characters interact. The directing was really huge too. Yes. Um, like I said, I kind of have formed my, my acting foundation through collaboration in every project that I do. And this was no exception. Yeah. Like I said, I came into this with no experience. So I leaned really, really heavily on the writers and the directors. Um, and in, because it's a localization, the performance of Maya Sakamoto, yeah. who is just amazing and is able to put so much emotion into a line um, that I, I really leaned on this being a very collaborative experience. 
I'm glad you said that, and it's important, and we talk about the writers and a lot of the games. Um, you know, I, a lot of the same people work at Square um, on these projects from title to title, the directors, the localizers, and they do such a fantastic job, and it allows the opportunity for the actor to have the moment. So um, exactly. as much as I do praise you, and it is warranted praise, there are so many people in this collaborative process um, that allow you to have that opportunity because bad writing will always be bad writing. <laughs> You know, it, and, and no matter how good of an actor you are, it is really hard to make bad writing sound good. Yes, it, it is. And, you know, to some degree, that's how you know a really good actor is they can, as it said, polish a turd. But, <laughs> but sometimes you can't. Sure, it's so. still a turd. A turd is a turd, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I felt very lucky that we had a really, really good team on board yeah. because I was not sure how this remake project was going to go, but I gained confidence that people would like it through the recording process and, and getting to see a little bit of behind the scenes. Yes. Beautifully received across the board remake. Then we step into Crisis Core. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you I, I assume you knew Crisis Core existed. You knew about the relationship mm -hmm. and the history between Zach and Aerith. What is your mind frame for something like that? Because from my vantage point, we see, um, obviously, Crisis Core existed in the PSP version that was out. Um, and we see a, a, a younger, more youthful, and a little feel like there's, and I'm curious of your opinion, slightly different perspective on things despite being similar to her life and her history um, with Aerith's relationship with Zack. You know, I feel like she learns a lot from Zack and takes a lot of his philosophies on and carries them on into the remake story or Final Fantasy story. Um, was there any sort of sense from you to play Aerith or from her story being more youthful or um, being less um, to where we see it at Remake? Yeah, so when I first found out that I was going to have to find a way to portray Aerith as a few years younger, there, there was a sense of slight trepidation for mm. me because, again, didn't have a lot of experience. I had never done this with a character before. And... Um, I really wanted to make sure that I didn't make it gimmicky. Yes. A lot of times when you think about, I'm going to age down this character, <clears throat> you only think of pitching them up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not really as effective as understanding different ways that teenagers view the world. Mm. And so I really, really tried to avoid that common pitfall of, well, if I just make her voice higher, then she's younger. Yeah. Um, and luckily, the writing really suits that. Yes. Because she's a lot more reserved in Crisis Core. She is not playful, Really, she is very um, naive and shy almost. You know, Zach is boisterous and loud and silly and, you know, falls into this church and just shows her a, a levity to life. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful because... That's what she does for Cloud in Remake. Yes. And Zach does that for her in Crisis Core. Yeah. And it's it's really, I can't explain how fun it was to be able to take the same character and reverse her like that. There, they, just as an actor, that is that that taught me more than all my acting classes. <laughs> wow. You know? Yes. Like because of those very specific circumstances of this is the same character but with a different foil yep. that teaches you about story, that teaches you about characters, that teaches you about so much. So that was such a unique joy as an actor. So it's such a, you know, we crave juicy characters mm -hmm. to work on as actors. And this has been, it's, it's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Truly, I think all... <laughs> it's as juicy as it gets. It is. It truly is juicy as it gets. And to... to to see that that growth continue in the story um, now with what we've seen with with Rebirth and where the story goes and kind of some of the, 
intense moments that are that we've seen from trailers that are to come. You know, this it, things are really the the gas is is, is accelerating at this yes. point in the story. And yes. um, I'm curious. This is, and I'll speak from the original game's perspective simply on this. Um, historically, Aerith is this character that is within the world of storytelling one of the most impactful characters in all of video game storytelling for certain the effect that in the original game her death has had on people um throughout gaming and and the the way that that plays on people's experience of characters that you didn't really see that in gaming ever at that point no. you didn't really see that gaming and it's something that obviously um people are always... well it wasn't common in any media at the time very really. true very true at the time the the strategy was let's have you build up a love for this character and then the climax of the media whether it be a movie or a tv show or whatever is going to be the character dies at the end yeah with Aerith in final fantasy 7 she doesn't wait till the end because her death isn't the end of the story. Yep. It's the beginning. Mm. And so that that was revolutionary at the time. Yes. That didn't happen a ton. No. I'm not going to say it never happened, but it was not common and it wasn't expected. And that's why it hit people the way that it did. Yes. I remember, I mean, there was literally, I remember being on GameFAQs. Do you remember this website? It was called GameFAQs. Yeah. And, um... There was like tons of us, myself included, looking for the ways to bring her back to life. The cheat codes, mm -hmm. the various glitches, game sharks. There was so much like no one could believe it. I remember there was like if you could bring like f like these certain items and like there was just so many different ways because people couldn't believe that th that a game did that. That a game did that to a character that was so beloved. Um, and I think it's a testament to the effect that the character has in storytelling on their own in their own right and what they do to cloud you know the main character of the story it, it is it shatters you and i think a lot of people are very curious about what's going to happen in this game and see you know we're, we're seeing our obviously alterations with um zach in these trailers and people are like what's going on what's with the timelines <laughs> i'll ask this question in terms of the public um hysteria we'll call it or constant questions how have you felt about those looming questions that people have had and the experience that the public is having based off of the slow drip of media that's been coming out it's really fun <laughs> <laughs> it's fun and it's torture and it's i will say i'm not entirely removed from it because I have said many times, and I really mean it, they only tell me what I need to know the day I am recording these lines. Yep. And they don't tell me anything outside of that. And that's for the best mm -hmm. for everyone. And that's also pretty standard for video game work. Absolutely. As far as I understand. I haven't done it, but I've heard a lot from my peers. And apparently it's very common when you do voiceover work, you show up in the booth and you read the lines, they give you context if you need it. And then you say the lines yep. and then you're not super involved in the project. Besides that, you don't get one big script at the beginning. You don't do a big table read through like you do with uh, film and TV. So it's really, really a different experience. Uh, we don't, record in chronological order we sometimes have to re-record things it's all very mishmashed and confusing to us the actors yeah so i also am over here wondering what happens yeah <laughs> a lot yeah. of the times i also don't know what's going on and yeah. i'm so excited to play the game in its entirety so that i too can maybe figure it out yeah, I'm right yeah. there with you. I obviously <laughs> know more than other people. Of course. I know Myself more than included. most. Yes, <laughs> but I don't know everything. And so it's it's really fun to get to be on both sides. I get to be yeah. a little bit behind the scenes, but I also still get to be a fan. It's, it's kind of great. 
what a gift. What a gift. Truly. I'm so happy for you too. Cause because it is such a the recording process is its is its own experience and it's great to have that. And then it's wonderful as a gamer, as a fan, to get to experience what they've crafted all of that into. Um I'm so excited for you to play the game. If you don't mind, I have just like a couple more questions really quickly, yeah, if that's cool time. with you. Mm-hmm. Um so I, I know you said um that one of your favorite lines from uh remake was um uh, I believe it's like don't fall in love with me or you can't mm. fall in love with me. That was you, you said that was one of your favorite moments. Mm-hmm. Does that do you believe after recording for Rebirth without if you without revealing the line, um, is there a line that comes up in this game that you fell in love with more, or do you think that that still kind of stands as the champion of uh, of lines that um, that really kind of so far in the process has has impacted you? We recorded remake before. COVID Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we recorded rebirth after COVID. And so I, I don't remember as much about recording rebirth as I do recording remake. Interesting. And I think there are, there were so many moments in rebirth that I just got giddy about being able to share with everybody. But I remember them in more general terms. I don't remember the lines specifically. But the cool thing is that when I play Rebirth, I know it'll all come back to me as it gets refreshed. Yeah. So you can ask me that again after I've played the game. I will. I will. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll have a different answer. Wonderful answer. No, great answer. <laughs> again, I didn't expect anything of of, of tangible thing. I'm just uh, I'm just more you know uh, excited, and I think a lot of people are for what the process is for someone like you specifically you in this this game because there's so many swirling questions um uh, of yes. what's going to happen and um i guess the, the the broad question i would ask is what are you without s- specifics in terms of what happens in the game what are you most excited for people to experience or learn or you just seeing from an outside perspective, the actor involved, what are you most excited for people to take away from Rebirth after playing it? Uh, let's go with Gold Saucer. Gold Saucer. Okay, <laughs> great, 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 great answer. All, all, of, all of the Gold Saucer stuff is really, really good. Yeah. And definitely while filming or while recording some of those scenes, I was elated. Yeah for people to be able to experience them, (laughs) especially because I know that when we were, or when people were playing Remake, they finished the game, and then there was a discourse of, well, what's next? And everybody said, I can't wait to see the gold saucer. Uh So then being able to go and record those scenes and keep them secret, secret, Uh I'm really excited for people to experience. I, I I mean, I spent so much hours of my life in Gold Saucer doing everything that that has, the mini games, the chocobo. <laughs> it's just such a phenomenal thing. I can't wait to see that myself. Great answer. Um, yeah, I, I think people are going to be blown away by everything in this game. Uh, but there's just there's just so many possibilities of what can and will. Uh, it's going It's a big game. It's going to be kind of. I think it's, it's a really. Big it's going to explode, kind of the internet and the world. Um, just everything that is jam packed into this installment. Um, I also wanted to ask quickly too, if you don't mind, in terms of Aerith's character. Um, you know, we see her relationship with Zack in Crisis Core. Um, and I kind of spoke a little bit about how I believe, and I think you agree, that she learns so much from him and takes on a lot of his his personality, if not his values. And then Remake, we start to see a little bit of her instilling those beliefs onto Cloud. Um, and in Remake, even, there's a moment we see in the trailer. Zack makes a promise to Aerith um, that they're going to go to the sky um, and they're going to see out there, and we see that first moment of Aerith coming to the sky with Cloud. Do you believe that they're, um, er- from a relationship, maybe this is a question as a fan, or I, I don't know how you want to answer it, um, that Aerith is is taking some of that relationship that she wishes she had with Zack, or just literally as a human experiencing Zack, and trying to share those with now Cloud? Um, how do you feel that those relationships are intersected or intertwined just from her as a human having dated Zack and now experiencing a story with Cloud? That's a really great question. And I really... Because it's so not only in-depth 
but such a it's something that the fans are really really passionate about sure sure because it's so filled with emotion yeah that how could they not be passionate about it and so i really have to when i answer questions like this lean on the source material yeah and and only <laughs> I truly listen. I understand now the, the predicament of the situation, and it almost to me because I, I exist in other video games as well. It's the almost it's, it's it, it it lingers on the the question of like ships to a certain degree, and which one do you like more? Which isn't the question I'm really asking. Um, it's you know I I, I I'll, I'll phrase something like this. I think it's fascinating to see a character who experienced such an intimate relationship with one character now experiencing values and morals with somebody else um, of a similar cloth, you know, from like a military perspective almost, you know? I think that it's one of those things that is sort of like holding sand in your hand. Mm. Because if you try to understand it and quantify it too much, all those grains of sand are just going to slip through your fingers. Yeah. It's one of those things that you have to hold loosely and not examine it too closely because it's so complicated that you almost can't pick it apart yeah. and explain it in black and white. And on top of that, there's a layer of interpretation because whatever someone's a player's life experience has been is going to change the way that they view that. So I am not the definitive spokesperson on what Aerith experiences in the game, but of course, of course she notices how similar Cloud is to Zack. Yeah. How could she not? And I think that in those early, sassy, playful, the rooftop scenes, she is sort of trying to get to know how much Cloud is like Zack. Yeah. She is trying to poke and prod and learn more about him because she does have this background of knowing Zack and wondering what happened to him. Yeah. I think all of that is there. And it's really complex. Yeah. And, and especially when she walks out and she sees the sky and she thinks of Zach's promise. Yeah. That's, a, that's a heartbreaking moment to really, if you think about it too hard. Yeah. No. Know, but it's super, super complex and it's a gray area, but that's almost... It, it's 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 a gray area because it's not black and white, but really it's not a gray area. It's a colorful yes, area. Yes, yes. It really is... All of the emotions, it's all of the colors of the rainbow that make up this beautiful mosaic that is that story and the relationship between these characters that could only have been told through multiple games over the course of 20 or plus years. Yep. You can't really reduce it to anything. You, you have to take all of that context into consideration. It's really amazing. Beautifully said, I, I must say, very beautifully said, and I think it does give context to a question that really doesn't have an answer because mm -hmm. number one I think when we play video games I mean how lucky are we through this series to have had so much about this game I remember playing Final Fantasy 7 when it first came out and I spent so much time in my life there was in the original game, there's this character who's affected by the Mako poisoning. And I remember everyone's like, is that Zack? Is that Zack? Is that character who's in the, in the Sector 7 slums? Is that Zack? And everyone's trying to quantify these things. Mm -hmm. And when you experience a game like that, there's so much mystery. And there's so mm -hmm. much like, you, you, as in life, we experience tragedy, we experience loss, we experience heartache. And we don't, we don't have to say like, you know, uh, like, let's say you experience the loss of a loved one and then you're going on a date for the first time. Um, we don't say, you know, as someone who has lost X, Y, and Z people, now I'm experiencing this moment like this. 
We just live life. Right. And those experiences yes. inform us. Um, and yes. I think that's very much what happens in this game. We've just been so lucky to have seen a peek behind the curtain with Crisis Core and some of the other stuff that existed between these characters. And now even in the, the Rebirth trailer, we're seeing scenes with Zack and, and Aerith laying in this bed. And we're like, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I appreciate your answer and thank you for indulging uh kind of a silly question but an answer which was actually really beautiful and I think a lot of people will take away something that is so um it holds so so much emotion for people and I think what right. you explained really is kind of the only way to each their own um to to take that away because there is so much that is involved you can't reduce it to like oh it is this it's 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 this like this <laughs> I think that's that's also a little bit of a cultural leaning, you know, it's, it's a JRPG yeah. and it, it's written by, you know, Japanese developers and it's consumed by people all over the world. Yeah. And I am the English voice actor and I mostly speak to the American audience. Very true. But there are different cultural influences as well that, that influence this story and these characters and American audiences really have an appetite for black and white. (laughs) We have an appetite for problem solutions. I understand that. (laughs) I love that. I want a solution myself (laughs) to everything. And we're very, very mm, plot driven in like this happens, then this happens, then this happens. But not all great art is like that. And I think that a lot of Final Fantasy's legacy and the overarching Final Fantasy universe has that element of mystery. There are going to be some questions that aren't going to get answered. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't have to be. But they are just one more color on the painting. That just in form that are just there to provide an extra element of something to provide depth, to provide beauty, to provide additional context, to provide mystery. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a maze with a beginning and an end. Yes. So there is, there's an element of that as well too. I think when we talk about things like this. It's that's actually such a great point because I think um especially because the English localization of Final Fantasy 7 and the remake is so pushed into the mainstream media we almost think of it as something like oh this was made with the intention <laughs> right. of this being an American only uh um you know consumption of product yeah. where those cultural meanings can get forgotten for a second because the characters mm-hmm. are speaking in English and there is they've done yes. great graphic works to match the flaps set moments and the gestures mm-hmm. to to fit the English pronunciations of words when we we do that stuff so I think that is such a great point and um it is um a great lesson for American audiences to know that there are wonderful stories that are not of um American or origination and and ways of storytelling that aren't the typical um story structure that we're familiar with so often um and i think the mysteries are wonderful and they keep us wanting more and i think that's partially the reason for the success of these these games um final fantasies in particular uh because they just they have a way of keeping you guessing wanting more not being black and white and um we're very lucky to keep getting more of it that they and and tell and told in in different with different spices now added to the equation Exactly. Through these remakes. So um, just a big old thank you for being a part of the series and lending your talent to the to the game. I'm so happy that this accidentally fell into your inbox. <laughs> um, it really did. It's, I don't know how it happened. It's so crazy. It still doesn't feel real. I, I, and that's beautiful. I think that enthusiasm is what makes many of us fall in love with Aerith. And I think it probably informs your performance Um because there really feels like there's a lot of love and care and wonderment that's put into what we get to experience. So thank you. There is all of that on top of the hard work and the technical difficulty. And I mean that as far as like the voice over work is very technical Mm -hmm. and difficult. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> match this exact frame, Sp- speak at this pace. Yeah. We only have four frames of whatever that you can't go over. Go up on this. You know, it is very technical while we, you know, and it's, yes. you know, because we, we experience the, the audience experiences as like, oh, I didn't like that line. Oh, that line was really great. You don't know how many times we had to do that just to get that within the frame of, of exactly. what we had on the ends. You know what I mean? So exactly. a little bit more difficult than, I, than people, I think, seem to understand extremely extremely difficult do you mind if but on top of all that you know go ahead sorry lots of lots of love in awesome here. no yes very much so uh could we end with a, a last question you've told us so many of experiences that you've had in your life i like to ask this question to my guests it's a bit open-ended doesn't have to be related to the industry can be related to the industry if you so choose um is there an experience that you've had in your life whether professionally dealing with acting or friends family animals, uh, food, whatever it is, an experience that kind of taught you a lesson um, that you take with you in life, um, whether it be through the formative advice or just experiencing it, that you think other people would really benefit from hearing a little bit about. Um, I talk a lot about my experiences with my animals and how they changed my life. And I can't believe I have not mentioned this very <laughs> quickly here, just a segue of it. I think I said this on on Caleb's episode. I had a cat that I named Eris, the Are the original did? English pronunciation of that we experienced in the localization of the original FF Seven, and um, I made a movie about this cat named Eris, and the f- the film is named Eris. That's how much your character Aww. has meant to me. It's crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. It's insane. Yeah. Um, in the film dealt with tragedy and loss, so a lot of things packed oh. into that name. But anyway, yeah. um, is there an experience that you've had in your life that kind of really left an impact on you or a, a piece of advice that came from that or a lesson uh, along the way that you could share? First one that comes to mind, maybe? Oh, gosh, that's tough. If I had to sum up the lesson that brought me to the role of Aerith, it has to be... Find what you love and do it. Mm. And don't let anyone tell you not to. Because it is your life. (laughs) And there are always going to be people who are going to tell you no. And as it turns out, one thing I've definitely learned is that hearing the word no, it actually doesn't kill Mm. you. (laughs) It feels like it does for a little bit. Especially when it's something you really, really wanted. I know the fear of rejection very well. But rejection doesn't ever kill you. And so you don't have to be so afraid of it. And ultimately, being told no a thousand times still means nothing in the face of being told yes the one time it really matters. I could not have said that better myself. And as uh, (laughs) someone who has a podcast about acting and dealing with rejection, we have not heard it said in that way before. Um, But it is so true. And you don't know when that yes comes around, what it'll mean or what it'll do or the liberation, the the self worth and reward that you will experience from that. Um, You don't know. So, yeah, I love it. Embrace your dreams. <laughs> and not just what it brings to you, sure. right? You know, of course, I was unbelievably excited to prove to my haters <laughs> that I could do this. But look what I've been able to facilitate the conversations that people have had about their life and about their heart and their passion because of Aerith, because of Final Fantasy VII Remake. I consider it one of the highlights of my life to just lend any part of me to the goodness that this project has brought the fans and the people who love these characters and these stories. The fact that I have been a small part of (laughs) the way that people coped through the pandemic... Mm. You know, I've heard so many stories about how Remake was like the one thing that kept them going in 2020. It's the one thing that reminded them to keep fighting when things seemed absolutely impossible. And so imagine 
if you took rejection so seriously that you didn't follow your dreams and you didn't do what you wanted to do, then if I had done that, I would have robbed myself of the experience of being able to be a part of something that brought goodness mm -hmm. to the world just because I was afraid of hearing the world, the word mm -hmm. no. It's, 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 it's like, it's bigger than mm -hmm. you. It's bigger than your own ego because if you can follow your dreams and follow your passion and bring something good to the world that affects others in a positive way, that is so much more important than your own anything. I think a lot of artists sometimes get caught up in the, um, what is this going to do for me? What is the monetary value of things? Um, I want people to know me or, you know, there's the whole idea of what fame can do to people or the pursuit of fame within this industry. Um, and we forget oftentimes, especially people who have been pursuing this since high school or college when we're young, that we get into this and we fall in love with acting because of what storytelling can do for us humans. Mm -hmm. And we saw it no better time than during the pandemic when the only thing people really had to get them through things within the, the four walls that we were pretty much stuck in was stories. Um, and there was an absence of a lot of new stories for people. Um, nothing was being made. Um, thankfully, voiceover was able to be continued. And we saw how powerful storytelling through video games and animation and anime was. Um, I put Final Fantasy VII up there of one of the contemporary pieces of art in every media through a storytelling perspective that has just been phenomenal. Um, and on behalf of the fans, as a fan, just... Thank you, and thank you for, for not listening to those no's um, because now we get another person that was a piece of the puzzle to making what we know and globally love. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what this game does for yeah. people, the way that it reminds them the importance of friendship and the importance of perseverance. I highlight of my well, life. I truly mean well, it. Well, Thank you again, Brianna. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for being an amazing person. I'm so excited to see <laughs> more of Rebirth um, and your performance and for everything that we have in store um, through Final Fantasy. Um, congratulations. Um, it comes out on February 28th. Is Besides that, 29th. 29th. Gosh, 20, you know I, mean? I guess 28th for... It's, yeah. 29th, because it is the last possible day that... It could be in a February. Wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. February 29th. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Well, I look forward to it. Um, I believe people can find you at Brianna White on social media, correct? On Instagram and Twitter? At It's, it's Brianna, Brianna White. White. See, there we go. Good thing I asked. I didn't just, I didn't just <laughs> assume. Uh, everybody follow along. Thank you again for coming on the show. Um, I'm looking forward to it. This is a great convo. I'm looking forward to the game coming out. Thank too. you. Thank you. Gosh, that was such a good episode. I literally like walked away in kind of awe to be speaking to Brianna about Final Fantasy and a character that means so much to me. I literally like ran out of them and was like, oh, can I record the, the outros? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. What? What a great human being to be put in a position to play a role that truly um, has changed the world. I know that sounds crazy to say, but it really did. I mean, the impact of Aerith and Final Fantasy together, those two things are a recipe for... It was a cultural uh, um, storytelling explosion of what people did and um, how people feel about the character. There's such a love um, for her and the story, and Brianna is just such... A gem of a human to be put in the position to play um Aerith. and the fact that it wasn't even supposed to come to her is just so crazy it's mind-blowing i really hope you guys enjoyed the episode um the 29th february 29th final fantasy um seven rebirth sasuke is saying hello here um check it out guys i think you're gonna love the game again i play chocobo billy in it so um what i've gotten to do was a absolute blast and pleasure um I really hope you guys enjoy the game and uh, stick around for more episodes. Like, subscribe, review, whatever you want to do. You're the best. I love you guys and stay tuned for the next one. Bye-bye.